how do you prevent accidents? Isn't that the $64,000 question? Well, first of all, to prevent explosions, fires, and releases, you have to recognize the hazard, right? You could walk past something a thousand times. If you don't know what it is and that it could result in a catastrophe, nobody pays any attention to it until it's been pointed out. The next one is you have to design an engineer. Well, this takes capital money, doesn't it? But it's important that that happens in order to reduce as much as possible or eliminate the hazards. Third one is management systems. And a lot of people are confused by this. And you know, our investigations used to stop there. We used to just say there were poor management systems. Well, we're driving the agency and the investigators to name those systems. So you actually know what it is has to be addressed. But management systems are things like procedures, training, uh, actually enforcing that the procedures that are written are actually being used. Those are management systems. These are the administrative controls. But the last one is human factors, and I want to talk a little bit about human factors. I talk a lot about safety culture. Safety culture is not on the shop floor necessarily. It starts, human factors starts in the boardroom. It's what is being created as the atmosphere for how decisions are made. And if you have committees of people who are deciding where your capital dollars are going to be spent, and you've got a safety project, and you've got purely production increasing project, and the production increasing project is chosen over safety, you got a culture problem. In the 1980s and 90s, as Leo mentioned, there were a number of catastrophic accidents that happened around the world, and here's a list of them. Many of them happened here in this country, and those are listed. And it was obvious something had to be done. And through the push of the unions and the push of the administration of um, the environmental organizations and others, um, some good rules got passed, and it's pretty odd for this to happen. But it was kind of snuck in, and I'm not sure the first President George Bush actually knew what he was signing when he signed the, uh, uh, um, the uh, Clean Air Act, but for that we're grateful because it also created the Chemical Safety Board. Incident rates are misleading. In the 80s and 90s, the Labor Department statistics showed that chemical and refining industry injury rates were half of other manufacturing sectors. But the death rate was higher. You know, a death and an injury are recorded the same. Contractors were not included, and to this day, we know the contractor accident rate is not included and they are one of the most killed group of people. Public victims also weren't counted. So when you had neighbors, the people in the community who were, not, who were killed or injured, they were not counted. Why would then something not change? Well, here is a pattern of causes that was investigated and was identified and was presented to Congress that said something had to change. There were poor hazard awareness, lack of training, poor design and engineering, poor maintenance, unsound operations, poor decision making, lack of accountability, little employee input or avenues for communication. This wasn't just in India, folks. This was here in this country. So enter a rule. Process safety management. How many of you are under process safety management rules? How many of you are not? Well, I want to tell you, you need to pay attention for the next couple of minutes. Because whether this is part of your rule management or not, this is good legislation, this is good engineering and operational practice, and you should have these in your organization as well. First of all, after years of debate, not TSM was enacted. It was a performance standard. Near-miss investigation provisions were included. 
OSHA had preemptive um, audit provisions, and OSHA had post-event enforcement provisions. Here is what that rule required. Do you see anything on here that you think is not a good idea? So besides OSHA getting PSMs, the EPA also passed a rule that was called risk management planning. Now while PSM was inside the fence management, RMP included everything in PSM in accident prevention, but also provided for emergency response. Do you know that most of the people who were killed in Bhopal died because they were issued an evacuation order not having um, uh, planned for an evacuation from that facility, and when they were told to evacuate, they ran out into the streets and were more exposed and died in the streets. Many of those who stayed in their cardboard and cloth huts were not exposed. Well, PSM and RMP implementation at the time was rigorous. Resources were provided by companies. I know I myself reported to a board of directors committee who was overseeing the implementation. Management tracked implementation. And they, where there were gaps, they filled them. Systems were implemented. Engineering fixes were uh, provided for. Training and procedures were developed. And there was an accountability. Is there any doubt that PSM was a good rule or that these practices were implemented were good? It initiated good engineering practice. Good process management yields good results. But it's hard to prove a positive impact without some kind of metric. And I got to tell you, in the 10 years or more, 13 years that PSM has been in place, we have no PSM metrics. Is it time for a wake-up call? Well, I think we've had it. This is a picture of BP's facility in Texas City. If anybody had asked me on the 22nd of March to name the top five companies, BP would have been among them.